Jack, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are positively taking the Maryland Crab Cake Tour on the road for the holidays. Maybe a little purple Santa, who knows, like the old days. But we'll be at Fadley's on the 9th, and we're uh, we're going to be moving on to Costas so later on in the month. I'm ironing that date down because we may have a shocking announcement about uh, some Rock and Roll Hall of Famers coming back to Dundalk for crab cakes uh, and the holidays. I actually had a bowl of half-and-half half Costas soup at halftime, uh, and uh, it didn't go so well. So I have to tell Nick and Pete maybe I should go with just the, the just the regular Maryland crab next time. But we'll have Maryland Lottery scratch-off tickets to give away uh, at Fadley's, Raven scratch-offs, as well as our friends at Goodwill. Enjoyed helping them on Wednesday. Had a lot of volunteers, a lot of people in need. It was a great, great event uh, on Wednesday down at the convention center, as well as our friends at Window Nation. Luke Jones joins us now in the aftermath of... Purple therapy? Is that what we would have called purple therapy at this point? What we need to provide? I don't I don't know what it is. I mean, it feels like it's been a little while since they lost, right? So for that, and we haven't discussed them losing in a while. Um, I had already put the cherry on the bow and had started, you know, writing my columnness about them as a victorious team. And then I had to sort of rewrite the script a little bit. Uh, I, just a, a crazy game. I, I'm still trying to process what the hell happened in the last 10, 12 minutes of that football game. So you're saying it's your fault. You jinxed him. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I will say this. It is the first Jaguars Ravens game I've ever missed. I went back through all of them because you know, we played in their division. And mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember Eric Zier tripping on John Ogden's leg, uh, you know, and, and lo losing a game at the end because of that. So, I mean, weird stuff has happened down there, let alone Wembley. But this one, this is an all-timer, man. This is right up there with Jimmy Smith for me, Zay, Zay Jones. Well, uh, yeah, in, in some ways it kind of felt like those early days where the Ravens couldn't beat the Jaguars. I mean, you were mentioning uh, the old AFC Central and you know, uh, one-time rivals where I can't see the, a Ravens-Jaguars game with, without at least thinking about Tony Banks and Shannon Sharp once. Uh, I mean, that was the game that put this franchise on the map in terms of really arriving. But uh, what we saw on Sunday... Uh, unfortunately for the Ravens, was very reminiscent for me of what we saw up in the Meadowlands back in week six uh, against the New York Giants in the sense that you had a Ravens offense that moved the ball up and down the field, well, between the 20s anyway, through uh, the first half into the, into, the, into the third quarter. And red zone woes, which have been the story of this team since week four, really. Uh, I mean, you go back and look, they were, I think, eight for 10 over the first three weeks of the season inside the red zone. Since then, nowhere close to 8 for 10. Let's put it that way, uh, without having the exact numbers in front of me. But uh, a game where it felt at halftime, like the Ravens should be winning at least by, let's say, two scores with the way that they moved the ball. The defense, uh, I mean, the defense played well in the first half, you know, one drive aside. And, and keep in mind, that was after uh, the fourth down, you know, unsuccessful fourth down try. Jacksonville got the ball at midfield on their solo touchdown drive uh, in that first half. Defense was phenomenal in, in the third quarter, two, three and outs and, and a, a takeaway. But then what we saw in the fourth quarter, which wasn't talking about that Giants game. I, I put that way more on the off the offense and you know, Lamar's pick and, and the strip sack to, to end it uh, and whatnot. But we saw a defense that played so well through three quarters fall apart in the fourth quarter, third and longs, fourth and longs that Trevor Lawrence. So give him credit. You know, he, he he's pretty good, by the way. He's pretty good. You see the flashes. Uh, I mean, certainly you look at the final numbers, three touchdowns over 300 yards, 29 of 37. I mean, that speaks for itself. You certainly can see times where he still shows his inexperience. And I, I would also say, you know, while, while he has some better receivers than the, the Baltimore Ravens have right now, still a team that clearly has a ways to go. But I was saying this, I was talking about this with you early last week. I talked about this with Dennis uh, as we got closer and closer to Sunday. If you looked at this Jacksonville team at three and seven, and look, I'm not making an excuse for the Baltimore Ravens here. You know, they they choked. <laughs> this is another uh, two score loss that they've blown, a, you know, a lead that they've blown in the fourth quarter. Uh, you know, it's it's a pattern at this point. It's happened in each of their four losses and they're seven and four, as opposed to being not saying 11 and oh, but. Nine and two, let's say, if you don't have that issue uh, to the degree that they've had it. But you know, it, it's certainly, you know, it's disappointing. And, but at the same time, this was a Jacksonville team that if you watch them on a weekly basis, they'd only had one loss 
by more than one score. It was a 10 point loss to, to Kansas City. They had a couple blowout wins under their belt. My point was they had second half leads in like seven out of their thing. I mean, like, you know, they're a team like the Ravens that if the game ended in the third quarter, they would they would have won a lot of games. Yeah, I mean, the point is, this is a team that if you're going to be sloppy and not convert inside the red zone, turn the ball over, you know, give up some big plays and some inopportune times, they're more than capable of beating you. And that's what the Ravens found out. And again, that's not to give the Ravens a pass here, uh, but I picked a 20 to 19 Ravens win. I thought this was going to be a close game, uh, but unfortunately, what we're seeing with this football team, as much as the last few weeks felt good because, hey, you know, they had won reeled off uh, what four four wins in a row you know when, when you come out of the bye week and uh you know even though it was ugly against carolina it was still a fourth straight win and, and you're talking about a team that's seven and three and in good position in the afc north and they still are by the way let's be clear about that but you looked at how some of these games were going in terms of the offense Yes, the defense played very well against Carolina and New Orleans but I think a few people uh, in town were a little too quick to to start pumping up what this defense was we, when you consider they were doing this against Andy Dalton and against Baker Mayfield, who, by the way, just got benched. Uh, so we saw it uh, once again, this team having trouble putting together a full 60 minute performance for the offense. It was three quarters of not being able to put the ball in the end zone. Once you get inside the 20 for the defense, it was a fourth quarter where they fell apart and it adds up to uh, what was a one-point loss, a very exciting football game, if we're looking at it through a, a more objective lens, but certainly a very frustrating day for the Baltimore Ravens because, uh, again, another game that should have been in hand. When you talk about the fact that they scored to go up 19-10 with 13 minutes to go, the way this defense had been playing, that should have been that, but it wasn't. And that's why this team uh, was flying home on Sunday night having lost and kind of thinking back to some of those issues that were plaguing them earlier in the season, rearing their head on Sunday. Well, I mean, Luke, we'll chalk it up to, to red zone issues, right? We'll say that and say, well, you know, they're kicking field goals, a couple touchdowns there that they laugh and they win the game by 13 points and it's all good. And I agree with all that, but the mistakes, the, the, the drop, passes the the overthrows the Lamar runs left Lamar runs right Lamar runs Lamar runs when they don't have anything else and there were times they didn't feel like they had anything else now Oliver will talk about him and his homecoming and his revenge game against uh, Jacksonville who drafted him and then gave him away and uh and and him being targeted in the game but for me it's about mistakes it's about drops it's about overthrows. It's about the quarterback not being accurate. It's about receivers not dropping the ball when he is. It's about them not running the ball well and trying to run and staying on the run with it. Um, and all that comes before the defense, right? Whether it's Duvernay dropping a ball or whoever whoever's out there, um, you, there's always this flash of a play here or a play there or a week here. I mean, Deshaun Jackson – save the day for them for a moment, right? Like won the game for them with one crazy play. And he was sitting on a couch three weeks ago. Um, you, you know, they have that in them to walk the tightrope because they're good enough on any given play to complete a bomb after stinking all day, but they stink too much They're This is a wildly inconsistent offensive effort all the way around, whether it's sometimes protecting Lamar, sometimes, what they want to do. I mean, you want to beat up Greg Roman, have at it with him as well. But the whole thing's not good enough right now. It's certainly not elite. It's certainly not we're going to win three, four playoff games in a row like this. And then we'll talk about the defense. But to me, the offense, it's it's been not good enough recently to overcome mistakes, deficiencies, or, you know, when the defense just stinks for a quarter the way they did on Sunday. And that – no lead was safe. They had a three touchdown lead. They blew at one point with this defense, but I thought the defense had come a long way. And before I talk about that, I do want to talk about this offense. Isn't very good. Lamar wants $250 million. And I don't know where this is headed because it doesn't feel like a Super Bowl team to me. Well, I mean, it's just, it's not fully calibrated, right? I mean, it looked, they move the ball very well for stretches, <laughs> especially between the 20s. I mean, we saw that. I mean, it, it's not as though they went three and out and three and out and three and out. We didn't see that. 
Uh, we, we haven't seen that too often, although we saw more of that against Carolina last week, uh, certainly. But it's just it's off. And I want to throw something else in there. This team's continued issues getting out of the huddle and getting up to the line of scrimmage and calling plays. I mean, we saw that cost them once again in the first half. I mean, that's something that's been going on for years. You tolerated it when this was an offense that was firing on all cylinders, or at least most cylinders, you tolerated that a little more. And you know that a Greg Roman offense historically, going back to his days in San Francisco, has not been a pace, fast pace kind of offense. But it's magnified when you're not operating uh, at as high of a level consistently, and you're having a delay of game, or you're in a position where you're rushing to the line of scrimmage. And you know whether Lamar can check into a play or check out of it, you're just very rushed in those situations. And it's something that has been asked about. It's been asked about over and over and over. There are certain elements of their offense that I do understand because they do sub a lot and they do use pre-snap motion. At the same time, that, that, that can't happen. You're not seeing other teams around the league consistently, at least good offenses around the league doing those types of things consistently. So it, it's very frustrating in, in that sense, because uh, again, they are moving the ball, but you've got to score when you, when you get inside the 20, you certainly have to sc- score when you get inside the 10. Uh, I mean, you look at their first two scores of the game, a 27 yard field goal from Justin Tucker and a 29 yard field goal from Justin Tucker. Okay, that was great when it was Matt Stover and it was a 2000 Ravens and you're playing in an era where it wasn't so catered to the offense in terms of the rules and everything. But that kind of football is not going to play, especially not going to play come January. Uh, I mean, it's just not. We saw it. uh, And I mentioned it in my uh, five predictions for for Sunday and talking about the fact that uh, this defense, this was going to be a step up in terms of playing a better offense than they had played uh, in recent weeks, kind of going back to probably the Tampa Bay game. You know, this uh, Jacksonville, it's not a great offense, but certainly better than Carolina, certainly better than New Orleans. You know, when, when you look at it, a capable quarterback, so, let's start with that. And, and, yeah, and I mean, Doug certainly Peterson a higher ceiling. Right. He's doing. Yeah, sure. Right. A higher ceiling. And, and as you mentioned, Doug Peterson, I mean, a Super Bowl winning uh, head coach. So, you know, as well as. You know, as well as the defense played for three quarters, that that's where uh, it can rear its ugly head if you're not finishing drives inside the red zone. And as a result, it's a one score game, or in this case, it was a nine score, a nine point game. Uh, you know, and again, I don't want to excuse the defense. That was well below the bar in the fourth quarter. That's why I kind of view this as a team loss. For me, it was much more frustration for the offense, especially in the first half, but even into the third quarter, and then more so on the defense in the fourth quarter, although certainly the Gus Edwards fumble uh, did not help as that gifted Jacksonville three. And uh, thank goodness for Roquan Smith would have been a touchdown probably on that third down tackle that he made. So uh, it's just, it's frustrating from the standpoint of you see the, more than glimmers, right? I mean, it's large stretches. I mean, it, we've talked about it. it. They mentioned it during the CBS telecast on Sunday, how little that this team has actually played trailing in football games, you know, it, it has not been much. I mean, Sunday actually represented it, represented you know, <laughs> some of the bigger stretches of time that they've actually trailed in a game. It, it's been so fleeting in that res- in, in that regard, but it's a 60 minute ball game and this team, for whatever reason, and I think you can chalk it up to everyone and everything at some point in time, uh, even on Sunday, they just, they really struggle with that. And again, some of the issues they've had. Yeah. You'll be fine against Carolina. You'll be fine against New Orleans. They'll probably be fine against the Denver Broncos, who are a mess. And and Russell Wilson looks more and more like a guy who is closer to the end of his career than anyone thought, you know, with the way that that offense has struggled. But if we're going to continue to look at this thing in terms of not just, I mean, you take it a week at a time as a team, but as you and I and, and fans are looking ahead and seeing how this team might stack up to the other heavyweights in the AFC. I, I'm seeing flaws that are going to do them in and they're going to do them in sooner rather than later in the postseason. So that's where it's frustrating. And well, it did him in against Jacksonville on Sunday, right? right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And I want to be clear about that. I'm not just, and that's not even me just making an assumption. No, I mean, this team still has three AFC North road games ahead. I mean, Cleveland looked pretty good on Sunday. I mean, give them some credit for what they did. You know, we've talked about Pittsburgh. No, they're not a very good Steelers team for their standards. Are they getting a little bit better than they were maybe in week four or five? I mean, we'll see. Certainly not expecting that to be a layup by any means. Nothing's a layup for this football team right now. I mean, as well as much as we talk about how well they might play for periods of time, they're doing a lot of things to 
lose football games. And ultimately it did them in on Sunday. And you mentioned it, whether it's errant passes, drops, you know, uh, an inopportune pen penalty at the, at the wrong time, uh, not getting up to the line of scrimmage, you know, giving up big plays on defense, which hadn't really been uh, a thing that they'd been doing, but certainly was a big thing uh, that did them in at, at the end on, on Sunday. You know, it, it's just, you know, something's missing. And I don't know what that is. And I'm not trying to be cryptic in saying that, but there's just something about this team, you know, even though they're seven and four, even though they're still leading the division, they're still in great shape. I still fully expect this to be a playoff team. I still expect them to win the division. But if we're looking at this in a big picture sense, why are they having such a difficult time playing 60 minute ball games? When you consider that this was now the 11th game in a row, all 11 games, They've led by two possessions. It's no longer double digits because they only got to nine as far <laughs> as their lead on Sunday, but they've had a two possession lead in all 11 games this year. And they're seven and four. If you knew nothing about the Ravens whatsoever, and I only told you that you would say something's amiss here, right? You would say that, uh, you know, uh, unless it's just, uh, I don't know, just some bad luck, miraculous, bad, you know, a bad team that miraculously, uh, has a has a way to lead in some football games. I think back to the 96 Ravens. They That team blew a bunch of leads that year, actually, because they couldn't stop anyone in the end. Uh, but just if you knew nothing about the Ravens, and I told you that in their all 11 games this year, they've led by at least nine points, knowing that's a two-score game, and I told you they were seven and four, you would say, you know, they've got a couple fatal flaws that are probably going to do them in when the competition ramps up when it really matters. Now, the playoffs don't start in late November or early December. So that's the good news, right? There is time to figure that out. But you know what I see uh, on a weekly basis, I I'm I'm still looking at this team as kind of at that next tier, you know, as not looking at them as the, the most serious elite contender group. I kind of put them at, the, at that next tier. And you know, Sunday was another example of why I'm reluctant to put them to, to have them graduate even after they had a four game winning streak. He is Luke Jones. He is Baltimore. Luke, you can find him out on the social media as long as Twitter is still alive out there. I want to give a shout out to all of our sponsors and friends that have uh, taken great care of us here during the holidays. Had a great, great Thanksgiving over the weekend. Uh, got out, did some visiting. We have a new sponsor with Drug City uh, and Dundalk joining us here beginning now. So we're doing some crab cake tour stops down there. We get out to Fadley's uh, as well as to our friends at Costas later on this month. We were at Pappas two weeks ago. It's been a uh, it's been a great little run of uh, getting together and a great holiday, which really sort of let the air out of the tires of a four-game winning streak and all this. Look, let's talk about the offense. I mean, we'll talk about the defense when the time comes and this latest thing, whether Marcus Peters is half over the hill and why they're looking to strip every single ball instead of trying to make some plays. Um, the pass rush. I mean, JPP looks like he's in quicksand all of a sudden. I don't know, right? We'll get to that. Offensively, let's talk about wide receivers. Let's talk about who catches the ball. Forget who's blocking because – they're going to miss Ronnie Stanley, right? So I could chalk some of the issues up and say, all right, it's it's certainly not going to be perfect without Ronnie Stanley in there. They need that for me to win four games in January, February. I won't, including getting past Cincinnati, right? So I believe that on Ronnie Stanley. But let's say, okay, he'll be back in a week or two or five or whatever Harbaugh is going to lie about this week, right? So Mark Andrews. Convinced that he's right, convinced that the shoulder's right, wide receivers. We know Bateman's not coming back, right? Like, can they do wide receiver by committee? And then the running back thing, I mean, Dobbins is going to be quick to try to rush back because he wants to get paid or whatever. They rush Edwards out there. He's fumbles. Like, I, just weird, weird Duvernay doesn't drop balls and drop. Like, th there was a, a series of things when John gets together – after all this is over with and talks to everybody, you'll say, well, you know, that that's not a trend. That's a one shot thing. But it is a trend that they want to run, run, run with Lamar, Lamar, Lamar when they get in trouble, trouble, trouble. And he's like a, a binky and him running is still their best play on any given play. If they really want to try to make a first down, they really want to try to get 10 yards on one play. Lamar breaking an ankle and falling forward for eight and being in second and two, it's still their best play. I, they don't have a play anywhere near that good other than it, Andrews, which doesn't feel as available as it has. Well, I, I think it, 
you know, what you just said, for me, I, I look at the rest of the running game on Sunday. I look at what the running game was until late against Carolina. Lamar, you know, when it when it's scrambling, even the design runs, typically that's that's working, right? I mean, you just you just alluded to that breaking not his ankle, breaking other people's ankles as they're trying to tackle him in uh, in vain, as we've seen that for the better part of five years now. Uh, five seasons now, but uh, I look at Gus Edwards, 16 carries, 52 yards, 3.3 yards per carry. Uh, Justice Hill, one carry, three yards. Kenyon Drake, two carries, two yards. I mean, you add that up, I think what you're seeing, we saw Carolina do it, uh, and I, without seeing the all 22 as you and I are reacting to the game, and uh, you know, as you know, maybe we'll get a little more clarity, uh, you know, a little further removed if, uh, as you take a look, but I think you're seeing more and more defenses are not respecting this passing game. And and I don't mean in the sense of how the Ravens have always been run first, but we've talked about this. You and I have had this argument, however many different times, in good nature, but talking about the passing game and what what level of efficiency they need to have. This is not an efficient passing game. I mean, Lamar finished with 254 yards, got the big play to Oliver, the enormous play to Deshaun Jackson. I mean, that counted for over 100 yards right there, 16 to 32. Now, some of those were drops, uh, as you alluded to. Some of those were some errant throws. I mean, a couple touchdowns uh, he could have had with a more accurate ball. But I think what you're seeing more and more is teams are playing more aggressively in the box, more aggressively trying to stop this run than they have in quite some time. Uh, Eight maybe guys even, up front. Come be baby. Right? And, and look, they're, they're, they always do that to a point. I want to be very clear about that. But are we seeing that even more? Are we seeing that to a degree that we haven't seen it since maybe Lamar's rookie year? Doesn't mean I think Lamar's playing like the rookie version of himself. I'm not suggesting that at all. But when you don't have threats to push the ball down the field. And again, it's great that Deshaun Jackson made a 62 yard catch. Can he stay on the field? Can he stay healthy? Can he continue to do that as he turns 36 years old this coming week? I mean, that's just the reality. Uh, there's a reason why you know, he was available uh, when he was and that, that the Ravens signed him to the practice squad. Uh, we, As you mentioned, no Rashad Bateman. He's not coming back this year. So do they have enough to put pressure on past defenses on the outside and deep? And when they get that opportunity, even though Lamar threw a beautiful pass to, to Deshaun Jackson, we've also seen some examples where they've disconnected when they've gotten that chance to make a big play. Uh, I think we're seeing a de defenses be more aggressive about the run. And I think even though we talked about it early this season, that Lamar was shredding the blitz early on, and we saw that big time against Miami in week two, we saw that against uh, New England in week three, that has kind of you know, that that being solved has kind of gone away. And I think if you look at Lamar's numbers against the Blitz since those first few weeks of the season, it's kind of reverted to where we saw it last year, where that wasn't you know, that wasn't something that they were able to to handle very well. So I think what you're seeing is a team that is kind of depending on the run as much as ever uh, in terms of what they would like to be able to do. But then if you get in a position where defenses are able to bottle it up some and it's it's not as though they didn't run the ball at all. It just wasn't, you know, they wasn't this 200 plus yards with the backs and 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 just being able to just grind it out and, and then finishing inside the red zone. Uh, you know, I, I think you're seeing teams just frankly aren't respecting this passing game, and I think it's they're respecting it less than they had even the last couple of years. They miss Marquise Brown. They they do, and I'm, it doesn't mean I didn't like the trade. I said all along the trade value was good, but they never replaced him. And when you when they were counting on Rashad Bateman, I guess replacing him, but being a better version of himself because he was already part of this passing game last year, he gets hurt. Then, well, you're kind of left with where they are right now, which is, you know, you, you mentioned Mark Andrews. I, a drop, drop aside. I think, I think he's going to be fine. You know, he's off the injury report. He's played a lot. I don't think he's ailing to a degree that, there, there's reason for concern, even if but he's not, not thriving right now. So that, well, that therefore I'm, I'm concerned. That's all. I mean, he is uh, fine, but I mean, four catches for 50 yards. I mean, he he was a big part of what they did last week too. Now, now Demarcus Robinson was a bigger part, but the, the overall point that I think you're trying to make is it can't just be Mark Andrews. That's it can't just be one guy. You know, it, it has to be two or three. Uh, at least, I think it really needs to be three. If we were talking about this team really having its best chance to 
not just make the playoffs, which I think they're going to do, but to go far and to make a deep run, I think it needs to be three. And I don't know. What do they have right now? One and a half? You know, they have Andrews. You know, uh, e- even the last couple of weeks aside, I'm, again, I'm not concerned there. But, okay, it was Demarcus Robinson last week. He had one catch on Sunday. Deshaun Jackson makes a big play, but is he going to make a 60-plus yard catch every week? Is he going to stay on the field and stay healthy? Uh, I, I have no idea. Devin Duvernay? It was nice to see him more involved this week, but that's been so hit or miss in terms of even getting him involved, let alone him uh, catching the ball like he did earlier in the season. So you know, I, it's I like a Miles this... Boykin thing to me, right? Like it's he, there, but I it's mean, not. Wait, he's better, way better, he's better than that. Better, I agree with better, that. Yeah. But, but although I will say as a side note, he had a rough day returning the ball, which is something, you know, I, I thought some questionable decisions. I mean, you know, not, not even just the kick return uh, that, you know, that certainly uh, led to disaster for the Ravens, but it's just, I don't see enough playmakers on this offense right now. I just don't. And as much as you, we can point to this or that or drops or overthrows or bad play calls or bad tempo, you know, it, it's just, it, it's not firing the way that it needs to. And as much as I, I, I do want to stress at the end of the day, they did have 27 points. That should be enough to win in the NFL. And that's why we'll get to the defense uh, when, when we continue our conversation. But I, I look at this and say, boy, they had 27 points and it could have been, they could have scored into the thirties. They could have been sniffing 40 points. If you can just figure out a way to finish inside the red zone, but well, they just... the defense gives them the ball and gives them a chance, right? The defense says, here's three, turn it into seven. You turn it into three. It feels like, it feels like a loss kicking field goals after they they strip the ball and fall on it, you know? Right, right. Well, I'm, and look at look at Sunday's game. I mean, Gus Edwards finally punches it in, and you know that, they got the ball at the 25 yard line after the strip sack and, and recovery. So you know, last week, you know, the, the the one touchdown they scored against Carolina came on a short field. So it's just you see it there, and it's great. Okay, there's a time where the red zone offense works, it clicks, right? But then when they get the ball at, at a normal spot on the field. They move all the way down the field and then it just, they, they just, they can't finish. They, they can't finish. And uh, again, I wish I knew that it was a very simplistic answer, but I, it's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that constantly. And well, that was supposed one- to be the Lamar magic, right? Spread them out way, way out and, and let Lamar run around. And that, you know, it takes six yards to tackle him, And, you know, he one on one, he'll, He'll get you yards. That that was always the word on red zone offense. They'll never fail it. I remember saying to you, come, they, they'll never fail in the red zone. Nobody can catch the kid. <laughs> well, but but this shows why, as much as people want to diminish the running or the passing game in this town, because hey, it's running the football and it's Lamar and it's a historic running game in 2019 and another 3,000 yard season in 2020. You have to be able to throw the football with a higher level of efficiency than this team does, and. You look at their numbers, they are, boy, they are being held afloat by what they did over the first three weeks of the season. Go look at their splits from week four on. This has been a bottom 10 passing game. Lamar as a passer, I want to stress that, not as a runner, because that is part of who he is as a quarterback. Let's be clear about that. I don't want to separate that. I'm not saying Lamar is a bottom 10 quarterback or a below average quarterback, but since the first three weeks of the season, statistically, it's been pretty ugly if you look at what he's done throwing the football in terms of yards per attempt, in terms of, I think he has seven touchdown passes going back to week four. And he's had Ronnie Stanley for half of that. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned that, because the one thing I do want to say that I think was a big problem when their passing game got into trouble last year and the year before was the pass protection breaking down so often. Any metric that I look at and and I'm going to be the first to say I'm not an offensive line savant in terms of like breaking down film and telling you what's a great offensive line and what's not. But I know pro football focus and ESPN with their pass blocking win rate and, and their different metrics that they have. They have graded and tracked this offensive line as being one of the very best in the NFL this year. So I'm guessing two sources saying that means that there's something to it, right? So, and again, I'm not putting it all on Lamar. I, I'll continue to say they didn't do enough at wide receiver. I've said that before, since before the season started. Uh, you know, I look at that, but you know, Lamar's missed on passes. There have been other times where the receivers can't separate. You know, there have been some games where that was more of an issue uh, than others. So it's just... It's not clicking the way that it needs to if you're talking about this team wanting to make a run when they start playing elite competition every week. 
you know, it, it's just, that's where I look at this thing. And it's why, you know, it's funny. I, I was even talking with uh, some of my family uh, you know, over, over this past week and they heard our post game conversation about Carolina and, you know, they were kind of saying, wow, you and Nestor sounded not, not all that terribly positive about them. I said, well, <laughs> I mean, Baker Mayfield's been awful and, you know, they, they won 13, three and they, they couldn't move the football against a team that's just not very good. They needed the defense to make a play right. to win that game. Right. right. So uh, th- that's where we look at this. And, and again, week in and week out, for the most part, their passing game's been stuck in the mud since the second half of the Buffalo game. You know, that that was two months ago at this point. So what's going to fix it? Well, I, I I'm, it was great to see Deshaun Jackson make a long catch. I'm very skeptical that – uh, if, even if he can stay on the field, that he can give them a big enough shot in the arm there. You know, we, we've seen Devin Duvernay, who started out really well. And for whatever reason, they either don't get him the ball or, you know, in, in some cases, maybe he doesn't make a play. Uh, certainly doesn't profile to be a default number one wide receiver. I think we can all agree on that, right? Same thing with Demarcus Robinson. Demarcus Robinson had a fantastic game against Carolina, but that guy's uh, been in the league six, seven years now. We're not talking about someone who I think suddenly – has this transformation you know? So you've got a bunch of number three and number four type wide receivers that are needing to be your starting wide receivers and your top wide receivers and shades of Willie Sneed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is. And you know, Mark Andrews is back now and healthy and that's great. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm not going to be all that concerned with you know, the fact that he dropped the ball and, and, you know, but again, it can't just be him. You know, so I just look at this thing and I, I, I see if I'm an opposing defensive coordinator, believe me, and this doesn't mean you're shutting down the Ravens. I mean, again, they still scored 27 points. Let's let's be clear about that. Uh, even if they were shut, uh, set up on a, a short in two field yards from 30. But <laughs> right. Exactly. But at the same time, if I'm an opposing defensive coordinator, I'm looking at this. I am doing everything I can to shut down the running game because I. I am not afraid of Lamar Jackson beating me with his arm. And I am certainly not afraid of these wide receivers uh, beating me down the field. So I think that's what we're seeing more and more. And I think that's what is kind of showing up. And, you know, Lamar and, running the ball is still the way to cut your heart out. It, it is. That's, it that's is. still their best chance of really beating your ass. Right. It's not yeah. the ball going up top or these nine play 81 yard drives where it's a zing and a zang and it's, they're throwing the ball seven out of nine play that that's not how they're going to do it. And I don't know that they can slobber knock or 14 play running oh. drives when Gus Edwards isn't getting yardage. And if Lamar's not getting eight yards on first down. Well, and this is what, you know, th- this brings us back to the red zone. And I made the point uh, at halftime of Sunday's game, I tweeted it out that at that point in time, the Ravens were one for six inside the red zone over their first six quarters coming out of the bye week. That right there is a formula for keeping even lesser teams firmly in the ball game. I mean, that's just the truth, you know, we, and this isn't a, anything that's new to the Lamar era. We talked about I, I can famously remember having conversations with you talking about in the Joe Flacco era at times when the Ravens would be going up against New England in their heyday or Indianapolis or, or Denver in, in Manning's first couple years with the Broncos, where you would just say, if you're kicking field goals inside the red zone, that's a, you're going to get beat uh, against those teams. And, and you know, while I certainly don't put Jacksonville in that category uh, as far as their offense, but it was a better offense than the Ravens have played here of late. And Boy, they 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 get they were able to finally get going in the fourth quarter, and well, all, all those missed red zone opportunities ended up costing the Ravens in the end. Even if again, that does doesn't mean I'm giving putting the defense, uh, you know, letting them off the hook because certainly we'll talk about what happened in the fourth quarter for that group. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't know wh- whether it's burying the lead to not talk about the defense first or talk about the offense. I'm more concerned about the offense than the defense over the longer stretch of what they're gonna need to do in January. Three. So for me, that's where we are. Luke is here. I am here. He'll be in Owings Mills all week if they let him. Uh, Denver is coming to town this week. Uh, they do not have John Elway or Peyton Manning or even Brian Greasy this time around. Uh, we'll be monitoring all that. Uh, happy leftovers to everyone out there celebrating Thanksgiving. We're going to get the Maryland Crab Cake Tour back out on the road. Brought to you by our friends at the Maryland Lottery, in conjunction with Goodwill, as well as Window Nation. We'll be doing the 9th at Fadley's. That is next Friday. And putting a date together for Costas before uh, Christmas as well. 
And uh, just, uh, you know, crazy times when the Ravens lose a game like this. We'll be talking about it all week long. Got a bunch of political stuff in here. Got some great sports stuff in here. Uh, if you have not heard our chat with uh, Mike Bordick and Adam Kalerick and his dad, Frank Kalerick, Matt at Papish, definitely want to check that out as well. I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, doing the purple therapy that we call BaltimorePositive.com.